Bill Townsend, we're very happy to greet you. I'm not even uh, an amateur public speaker. Well, most of my adult life has been spent in addressing small audiences of 12 men. <laughs> uh, captive audiences. <laughs> As they realized every time they looked at the sheriff in the event they wanted to leave but couldn't. I have, during the infrequent times that I uh, have addressed larger groups, I have always been reminded of the fact that they are not under such restraint, and I am apprehensive accordingly. Now, I'm not uh, familiar even with uh, gadgets such as uh, these. And if, during the course of what I say, uh, you uh, are not able to hear me and still desire to do so, <laughs> I hope uh, you will uh, indicate it because I realize that old soldiers are not the only fellows who sometimes fade away. <laughs> Not being the professional or amateur public speaker, I, I will simply desire this evening to talk to you a little while about a very colorful and a very great Kentuckian who, I think through no fault of his own, was lost for a good many years and who was discovered largely by accident while the investigator was searching for something else. I was uh, 13 years old when Cassius Mark Stellis Clay died. He lived about 60 miles from the little Salt River Valley in which I was born and reared. I never saw him. But in this uh, bitterly and strongly pro-democratic ex-Confederate community, I heard a great deal about him. I heard that he was a damned rascal, that he was a damned uh, cradle snatcher, and that he was a damned nigger stealer. And worse than any of these are all of them put together in the opinion of the community, he was a damned Republican. <laughs> older. When I came to college, I still thought of him as I had heard of him. Uh, of a fellow, as I've described, where the noun sometimes changed, but the adjective, except for certain embellishments, remained the same. <laughs> it was not until I was investigating an entirely different thing that I found how much truth may be distorted by passion and prejudice. Cassius Clay was a third cousin of Henry Clay. Henry was born into a modest family, family of small means, and he <coughs> never had much formal education. Cassius was born the son of the largest, one of the largest landowners and slavery owners in Kentucky, and he lived to be the oldest alumnus of Yale University. Henry, in afterlife,
became the owner of many slaves, but he declined to free them because he said that it was not practical to send them back to Liberia. Cassius, by inheritance in early manhood, became the owner of many slaves, and he freed them all. A hundred in one batch worth a thousand dollars apiece. So that I've always been a little amused at Henry's reason for not uh, emancipating his slaves, and I'm reminded of the philosophy of that uh, great old fella, Abe Martin, when he said that when a fella says it ain't the money I'm thinking about, but the principle, it's the money. <laughs> Cash Clay <coughs> was six feet three inches in height. You gather, gather some impression uh, about him there. He weighed on an average of 215 pounds. He was a raw boned, a big wristed, long armed, jet black hair that retained its color well past middle age. People said that Cash never lost a hair except what was pulled out in a fight, <laughs> and that that grew back immediately. <laughs> he had eyes, dark, flashing eyes, that glowed with intensity and with a peculiar intensity when he was around. He was, I think, as you will agree from looking at his picture, one of the handsomest men that Kentucky has ever had. Clay <coughs> went to Yale. He fell under the influence of William Lord Garrison. And then he came back to Kentucky. He plunged into anti-slavery. Contests that were going on then, particularly about the repeal of the Importation Act that had kept slaves out of the state of Kentucky. It was not long, having served two terms in the legislature, before he was known as the leading anti-slavery advocate in Kentucky. One of his main adversaries was Robert Wycliffe, Jr. Robert Wycliffe, Jr., as the pro-slavery candidate, <coughs> announced for the legislature, and he began his campaign. They <coughs> realized that they would have cash to contend with. And for the first and only time, so far as I know, Kentuckians felt it necessary to import <coughs> their gunmen and fighting men from outside the state. They sent to New Orleans, where there was a very large and a very reckless gentleman, who went by the name of Samuel M. Brown, and who boasted that he was the proud hero of 40 fights and had never lost a battle. The next week after that, they had a political rally out at Russell Cave, some five or six miles from Lexington, almost in sight of where my friend Squire Coleman lives. And Brown was there, <coughs> without Clay's knowledge, however. I don't think it would have made any difference. Anyhow, he was there without Clay's knowledge, and when Clay interrupted Robert Wycliffe, challenged some statement that he had made, Brown, standing immediately behind him, knocked him down with a walking cane. When Clay got up, drawing his bullet knife, as he did, he found uh, <coughs> Clay, uh, Brown, 
with a pistol pointed at his breast, standing about 15 feet away. And as he advanced on Brown, Brown waited until he got within arm's length and fired. But in another instant, Clay was uh, on him. He cut off an ear, so the indictment for a man says. <laughs> then for a good measure, he gouged out an eye. And then, uh, for a still uh, better measure, he split his head to the bone. And then, grabbing him by the neck and by the crotch for wrestler fashion, he threw him over a low wall. <coughs> and the proud hero of 40 fights rolled ignominiously down the bluff into the dark waters of Russell's cave. <laughs> They took Clay into the house to examine him, thinking he was fatally shot. And they found that as he had drawn his bowie knife, the scabbard had been lifted. The bullets had hit the metal point of the, of the scabbard, leaving only a little red spot over the heart. But the bullets had gone around and had cut out the back at his vest and dropped out on the floor. This intensely pro-slavery community saw that Cass Clay was indicted at once for men. And he was tried before a pro-slavery jury. But he was defended by Cousin Henry, who really turned on on that particular occasion. <laughs> <laughs> Near the close of his speech, Henry said to the jury, standing there without aiders or abettors, without popular sympathy, with the pistol of a hired murderer pointed at his heart, would you have had him meanly and cowardly fly? Or would you have had him do just what he did do? There stand or there fall. And then he turned to Cassius, who was sitting calmly at the trial table, and he pointed his long bony finger at him, and he said, if he had not stood his ground, he would have been unworthy of the name he bears. Well, the pro-slavery jury, for some reason or other, thought that Henry must be right about that. <laughs> that uh, perhaps that was a way for a Kentuckian to conduct himself, and he was resumed his anti-slavery activities. He soon found out, however, that uh, the newspapers, particularly the Lexington Observer and Reporter, refused to give him room for his remarks, finally refused even to print the schedule of his so he concluded that he would uh, found a anti slavery newspaper in Lexington that he called the True American. A paper that Horace Greeley said dared to challenge the, uh, to an unequal encounter the monster of anti slavery, right? across its own threshold. Cash evidently felt like he might have some trouble about this newspaper because he rented quarters on the second floor of a very sturdily built brick building <laughs> and he put sheet iron on both sides of the door <laughs> and he <coughs> loaded the two four-pound cannon, which he had purchased from Cincinnati, <laughs> with many balls and nails. And he set them so that they would rake the first landing breast high. <laughs> <laughs> and he got himself a stand of rifles and several shotguns. For he, he, as a matter of fact, uh, his weakness was bowie knives, but for his... <laughs> 
printers and so forth, he got these other weapons. And then he explained to his force that there was a hatchway in the, opened out on the roof, that if the worst had come to worst, if having uh, <coughs> sledged through the doors and having survived the hail of many balls and nails, they nevertheless were about to take the place, then his men were to leave by way of the hatch while he stayed behind to blow up the place with three barrels of powder, which he had... <laughs> <laughs> which he had secreted in one corner of the room. Well, I guess uh, fate was uh, pretty kind to everybody with respect to that situation. Trouble was undoubtedly brewing there. The community was very much caught up. And Clay <coughs> fell ill with typhoid fever and for weeks was delirious, and was packed with ice. During that time, they thought that that was a very good time for him to move. So a so-called committee of 60, which was actually a mob, aided by a bogus court order, they stormed the place and uh, under very weak or practically no resistance, they <coughs> broke up the plan. Again, they were uh, very much assisted on the matter of peace because they knew that Cash would get well sometime or other. <laughs> Couldn't anything kill him. And they knew he, they would have to reckon with him after a while, but when he got up, the Mexican War was on. He went off in his father's old militia company as a private, served in the Mexican War, became a captain of the old Lexington Rifles, and his military record was so good that when he got back, that forgetting for a moment their uh, political differences, the people of Kentucky presented him with a jewel sword, which uh, he afterwards wore with a good deal of pride, particularly when he was in Russia. <clears throat> in 18, uh, by that time, we had the 1849 Constitution convention. I don't know how the, the anti-slavery people of Kentucky, few as they were, constitution <laughs> in any way favorable to emancipation, but they did. They made a very hard and bitter campaign for delegates. The clay was in the forefront. He spoke at different places. Good many men were killed in that particular campaign throughout Kentucky. Over at Stanford, uh, Kentucky, they sent word to Clay that they would kill him if he came over there, which was right down uh, old Cage's alley, it seemed to me. <laughs> at any rate, uh, on this Saturday afternoon at the appointed time, he walked alone down the uh, aisle in the courthouse, crowded courthouse. And he mounted the rostrum. Started out by saying, now, <coughs> gentlemen, for those who have respect for the laws of God, <coughs> I have this argument, and he put the Bible on the lectern. That for those who believe in the laws of man, I have this argument. And he put a copy of the Constitution on the lectern. Then, uh, fixing his eyes on the most threatening group in the house, he said, and for those who believe in neither the laws of God or man, I have this argument. And he reached down in his old gray grip sack and he pulled out two long black pistols and he crossed them right here. <laughs> then he laid his bowie knife right across it. Uh, it is said that he had no trouble after that. 
and uh, finished his speech. But it was almost near the close of his campaign that he did have serious trouble. Strangely enough, it was almost in the front door of his father's old mansion and uh, plantation of about 2,200 acres called White Hall. It was at a place called Foxtown. And a man by the name of Turner, Squire Turner, and his five sons determined that they were going to do something about this clay. And they were going to put an end to all this uh, stirring up of enmities between neighbors. So when Clay began his speech, Squire Turner came up to the platform and he said, you are a damn liar. And uh, with that, Clay took, uh, briefly as he thought, time out. And he jumped off of the platform and hit this fellow in the face and said, you are a damn liar yourself. Whereupon, somebody hit him with the inevitable heavy cane and jerked his bowie knife away from him and stabbed him just over the heart. <coughs> it was then that uh, Clay uh, really thought that he had to exert himself, apparently. <laughs> and particularly in view of the fact that another one of Turner's sons uh, uh, came up with a pistol and snapped it four times in his face, and it never went off. But he reached and retrieved his own bowie knife by grabbing it with, uh, by the blade with his hands, it very severely cut his hands, wrenched it loose, and stabbed the oldest son of Squire Turner, Cyrus Turner. Next day, the Lexington Observer and reporter said, with reference to this melee at Foxtown, that uh, Mr. Clay was dead and that uh, uh, Cyrus Turner was not expected to live. Next morning, they said that was an error, <laughs> that uh, Mr. Turner was dead <laughs> and that uh, Mr. Clay was getting along pretty well. <laughs> About, uh, of course, uh, and I may say this, passing, that uh, one of the things that discouraged Lincoln, I think, more than anything else, ever to suppose that once slavery became entrenched, you could ever do anything about it. He spoke uh, in Kentucky, in Ohio, in uh, Indiana, and in Illinois. On the 10th day of July, 1854, he uh, rode into Springfield. His friends had been promised the use of the state house, but he found the house locked. And then he spoke out at Matheny's Grove. He said that he would never forget <coughs> Lincoln, who while he didn't sit on the platform, he lay out under the shade of a tree and whittled. He said, I shall never forget his ever sad face and his long, ungainly form. It was a right, uh, righteous sort of a speaking that they had there. He had many interruptions. Several times it was suggested that uh, uh, somebody take him down, but nobody did. One time, uh, he was at running. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, long after the crowd had gone away, that after Lincoln and Clay sat and whittled and talked about slavery. It was then that Clay, uh, Lincoln made a remark that Clay was always impressed by. He said, Clay, I always thought that those who hold the corn should eat the corn. Next morning, Simeon Francis in his Illinois State Journal 
had in his headlines, Cassius M. Clay makes a great heroic speech that he spoke proudly and defiantly in the face of great disorder. And he went on to say that I believe that he has spoken several times throughout the state of Kentucky, of Illinois, but only in Springfield has he been treated with disrespect. Well, it was not until, as you gentlemen know, several months later that Lincoln came out against the, the Kansas-Nebraska bill. If my recollection serves me right, it was in late August that he first spoke at uh, Winchester, Illinois. And early in October, he made his Prairie, his uh, Peoria speech. And then he spoke, I think, at Springfield. Everybody knows, of course, how that terminated and what bitter fruit that later bore. Cash uh, came back to Kentucky, taking things philosophically as he usually did, and was the anti-slavery candidate for United States Senate, and as usual was signally defeated. It was about that time, and this indicates that Cash at least had a little time out for humor, I said that uh, Lucretia Mott gave a dinner at uh, Cleveland. And uh, when he got there, he found that it was a mixed uh, party, colored people and white people. And he was vastly amused at the dubious confidence uh, a compliment that was paid him. But one earnest colored brother got up and proposed a toast. Cassius Marcellus Clay, the liberator. Though he has a white skin, he has a black heart. <laughs> well, by convention time of 1860, Cassius M. Clay probably was the best known emancipationist in the United States. Murat Halstead, in his uh, newspaper articles covering that convention, said that if the delegates on the floor could have elected, nominated Clay for vice president, he would have been nominated by acclamation that at one time a thousand voices shouted, Clay, Clay. But again, we find a man falling a victim to expedience. Here was uh, Mr. Hamlin, a good friend of the disappointed Mr. Seward, geographically situated right, living in Maine, and he had been a former Democrat. So Clay was dealt out. But that uh, in no wise put him down. Uh, he was on the husting, speaking, as he uh, had always spoken fearlessly for the party that was uh, against the extension of slavery. Spoke again in Kentucky, spoke in uh, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. And as indicative of what uh, Mr. Lincoln thought of Clay's services, I'd like to read you briefly from a facsimile of an original letter that's now in the archives of the Lincoln Memorial University. Lincoln wrote Mr. Clay uh, from Springfield on the 20th day of July, 1860. Honorable Cassius M. Clay, my dear sir, I see by the paper and also learn from Mr. Nicolay who saw you at Terry Holt, that you are feeling, uh, you are filling a list of speaking appointments in Indiana. I sincerely thank you for this, and I shall be still further obliged, if you will, at the close of the tour, drop me a line giving me your impressions of our, of our, 
uh, prospects in that state. Still more, would you oblige me if you will allow us to make a list of appointments in our state, commencing, say, at Marshall in Clark County, and then south and west along our Wabash and Ohio River border. In passing, let me say that all that at Rockford, you will be in the county where I was brought up from my eighth year, having left Kentucky at that point of my life. It was very truly a Lincoln. At the end of the campaign and with Lincoln's election, Clay, a good many people in looking over his correspondence, you can see that a good many people said that he ought to but uh, again, now uh, those doors seem to be closed, and yet it is my deliberate judgment that in those dark hours in Washington, when the six Massachusetts had been fired on in Baltimore and Lincoln was saying, is there a country or there is no nation? I think Cassius M. Clay gave Lincoln more sustained comfort, perhaps any other single individual. It was one day in early May, I think it was, that Lincoln observed a sight which must have given him very great comfort. As he drove out one afternoon out of the grounds on Pennsylvania Avenue, and here he saw a motley conclave of, say, two or three hundred men in Civilians low, with new rifles on their shoulders. Marching vigorously, but out of step. And at the head was a big, tall fella, also in civilian dress, but with one uh, his hat uh, pinned back over here on one corner, with a big bowie knife on his chest and a great big saber at his belt, who looked as though he would, was indeed spoiling for a fight. <laughs> And that was Cassius Marcellus Clay. It is said that he rendered a great deal of service in helping to defend the Navy Yard from a great deal of sabotage that doubtless would have come about at that time if, he, if it had not been defended. So thankful was the president of that service that he called Clay to the White House expressed deeply the thanks of himself and of his government and presented him with a long black barrel Colt pistol, which we shall hear about later on. It was about this time that uh, Clay took the appointment as, him, as minister to Russia. Now, that in itself, Gentlemen, as you may have heard, is a story all by itself. The general had many adventures over there. For some reason or other, the women seemed to like him over there. <laughs> they stormed, in fact, the embassy and uh, brought in their trunks, and he, being a Kentucky gentleman, could not say to them nay. <laughs> And uh, as to those who didn't like it, whether it be Duke or Orloff, whom he carved up in fine style in one of the royal forests with his favorite bowie knife, or some more lowly adversary, he treated them all alike if they really wanted that sort of treatment. <laughs> but we haven't time to go into that. Uh, I, all I might say is this that Clay at that time uh, began to wear what he called his dress-up boy knife. <laughs> he, before that time, had worn a more serviceable, if less flashy, horn-handled boy knife. But uh, he, whether it was presented to him or not, I don't know, but he acquired in some manner a very beautiful knife which, as he said, he called his dress-up boy knife, and when he 
put on his fine clothes to go to the Russian court, he invariably wore that knife. And he continued to do that after he came back uh, to the United States. Thereafter, he continued to wear this particular boy knife. And it must, I think, have been about 1869, when he had finally come back to the United States and had gone back to Whitehall, that he wrote uh, uh, a strange sort of document, but one eminently practical who was interested, uh, who might be interested in Bowie and I fighting. He entitled it The Technique of Bowie and I Fighting. And he went about it in a lawyer like way to explain the technique of that fighting as he understood it. He said that uh, the first move that you should make upon your adversary was to obtain a headlock with your left arm and then drive very viciously back of the left clavicle, <laughs> thus severing the... Uh, as if people perhaps didn't know their physiology, he told them about it. He said, thus <laughs> severing the juggler. <laughs> but he said, you frequently run into an agile adversary who thwarts this maneuver. <laughs> he said, under no circumstances must you then shift to the chest walls as I used to do before I became experienced. <laughs> that there is uh, too much danger of hitting a rib. <laughs> now he said the thing to do if you are thwarted in what uh, is the finest uh, early tactical maneuver. Then you should shift uh, and drive to the hilt with great force on a line with the navel. <laughs> that it has been my experience that it produces great shock. <laughs> <laughs> and that it almost invariably puts an end to the encounter. <laughs> and when you see his knife, <laughs> There is the dress of Bowie Knight, the very identical one that he carried. And this is the one that he depended upon to produce great shock. <laughs> this is the one that was under his pillow the very hour of his death. But uh, <coughs> it was not long after that that uh, it seemed that a series of untoward uh, happenings caused the general, the old line that he began to be called as his hair grew white, <clears throat> as he uh, uh, did fall into more or less evil days. One uh, evening after he had been over, back over here some two years, he and Mrs. Clay were giving uh, one of their brilliant parties out at White Hall, this enormous 40 room old mansion between Lexington and Richmond. Clay and several gentlemen were seated out uh, to the left of the piazza under a uh, giant forest tree. Uh, <coughs> plainly in the moonlight, a uh, carriage drove up to the gate some 50 yards away, perhaps. The general got up hastily and walked down there. A heavily veiled uh, young woman got out with a little boy about eight years of age. And she said, uh, General, I have brought you your son. <laughs> the general bowed low and he said, Madam, May I take him in and look at him? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, that has always seemed to me to be a reasonable request. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, she re realized it too, and she said, of course. So much to the great surprise of uh, these gentlemen who were witnessing the other people being in the house, General very gently led this little boy up the gravel path and into the uh, doorway, reception part of the palace. 
under the giant chandeliers which still hang in this great old empty house now going to rack and ruin. <clears throat> then he leaped and pulled off his cap. Then he <clears throat> laid him gently back. Nobody knows exactly what he said to this lady. Other than uh, after a brief conference, she got in the carriage, drove away, and he brought <clears throat> this boy back, brought him up town, and introduced him as his son from Russia. <laughs> well, <clears throat> uh, Mrs. Clay apparently didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the general always seemed at least mildly mystified about it. Uh, <clears throat> the fact that Mrs. Clay should not love this little boy as well as he did, and as well as he loved his other children, and he did love them. So <clears throat> it was not uh, to be wondered at that uh, Mrs. Clay in a few weeks took her children and moved back to Lexington, her old home where she remained, leaving the general and this uh, little boy with the colored servants in this big old house. The little boy, I presume, could speak only a few words of English. Living here with this man who was a stranger to him, he began to fall off. And then the general had got the, the hallucination, the one particular aberration that he had all his life after a particular incident that I'll tell you about, got the better of him. While he was in Lexington, while he, at great cost and risk to himself, was fighting the battles of the slave, a colored uh, one of the slave girls became disgruntled one day and poisoned two little girls. One six and one two, and both of them lay dead one Sunday afternoon in the same parlor. After that, he, uh, even when he was quite old, he, he was skeptical about food. He uh, it was intensified as he got older. So as this little boy began to decline, he immediately uh, got the notion colored servants at the instigation of Mrs. Clay for feeding slow poison to this little boy. So he got out uh, Lincoln's pistol and his bowie knife and he ran all the servants off. Particularly ran off a big uh, buck nigger by the name of Perry White who he'd had some trouble with before he had been stealing from him. <coughs> And Perry served notice on him that he would uh, be back right away. So on another early afternoon, as the general uh, got on his horse with the little Russian boy behind him to go over to Richmond to get his mail, he saw White with a rifle down in the woodlot. And just as he got on his horse, uh, the bullet whistled by. Well, Clay had in a holster, uh, as I do here now, uh, Lincoln's pistol. <laughs> and uh, while it was not his favorite weapon, uh, uh, he could do right well with it in a pinch. <laughs> so he galloped down into the woodlot before Perry could load his gun again, and he killed him. That was about the only instance that I ever knew of where <clears throat> there wasn't at least some question as to whether there might have been self-defense or not. And he wasn't even tried, as far as that was concerned. Well, <clears throat> it was not long after that before another serious blow fell upon the old lion. Over in Lexington, William Cassius Goodlow was his favorite nephew, a man he loved as his own son. 
A young chap who had been with him as Secretary of Legation in Russia. Who had uh, been uh, quite successful in business. And lived in a very fine house that he called Loudon, just outside of Lexington. The old general heard one day, or rather read one morning in the election observer and reporter, Colonel uh, Goodlow, his nephew, and Colonel Armstead Swope, warrior of Lexington, had had an altercation in the lobby of the King's Hotel, and that more serious trouble had been averted, only because his nephew, Colonel Goodlow, had declared that he was unarmed. Well, that disturbed the old gentleman a lot. He, uh... <coughs> carefully selected what he thought was the particular knife best to aid in his uh, nephew's defense. I have it here. <laughs> <laughs> and he uh, put it in his pocket and he went over and he had a talk with William Gagius. And he said, William Cassius, is it a fact that you have said that you, have you, are you correctly reported? That you were not armed the other afternoon? And uh, William Cassius said, yes, Uncle Cash. Why, he said, for the last 70 years, I could never have made that statement and been the truth. Why, he said, I am, I am astounded that you wouldn't be armed. Now, he said, you take this knife. Armstead Swope insults you again and you don't kill him? You're no clay. I never want to see you again. About three or four afternoons after that, as William Cage's good low went into the post office to get his mail out of a lock box he had there, he saw Swope who by some strange quirk of fate had a lockbox just beside his own. When Swope saw <laughs> Colonel Goodlow, instead <coughs> of getting his mail going on away, he continued fumbling around with the mail and eventually began talking to somebody through the box. Cassius stood it as long as he could very well. Then he came up and he said to Swope, he said, you obstruct the way. Swope said he didn't give a damn, but he did. Whereupon, uh, <coughs> Goodlow said to him, this is the second time you have insulted me. Nobody knows exactly who started to draw first, but Swope drew his pistol and shot Colonel Goodlow through and through. Happened. And then, by that time, Colonel Goodlow had his knife out. The first time he struck him was in the left armpit to the cavity. Then he struck him uh, unmindful, apparently, of uh, Uncle Cash's admonition about the ribs. He struck him on each side of the breast bone, but successfully. <laughs> and then he struck him some seven or eight or nine more times. Goodlow trying to shoot, uh, Swope trying to shoot a second time. Uh, he was struck uh, in the right wrist with this knife, and he lost his pistol. And then he lay down upon the stone flagging of the uh, post office lobby and died with a knife in him. Goodlow walked down the street to the office of uh, Doctors uh, Young and Stockdale prominent surgeons opposite the Phoenix Hotel, and uh, uh, shortly after that, pending after an examination, he was removed to the Phoenix Hotel. He evidently felt like that he had been mortally wounded, and he said to Dr. Young, thinking of his family, Doctor, if I should die before Mary gets here, Tell her that I thought of her and the children, and I did not strike until I was first struck. 
and then two days later as the funeral procession. Colonel Swope was passing the Phoenix Hotel, William Cash's good low died. When I was writing Lincoln and his wife's hometown, I went to Richmond. I spent a <clears throat> memorable afternoon with an elderly country lawyer, Jerry Sullivan, who had been the confidant and advisor, legally and otherwise, of Clay for many, many years. that had been made upon the body of Colonel Swope. He said the old general was terribly downcast, saddened at the death of his favorite nephew, but that over it all was a savage joy that he had acquitted himself and became a clay. And he called Jerry's attention to these wounds on Colonel's body here and the deep stab wounds in the chest and so forth. Then Jerry said that the old man looked out the grimy windows of this little country law office and the tears rolled down his cheeks and dropped down from his whiskers onto his immaculate shirt front and then he turned to Jerry and he said, Jerry, I couldn't have done better myself. <laughs> well, it's frequently said that it never rains until it pours, and I think that's true. The little Russian boy was growing up, and he wasn't growing up very well. He wasn't growing up to be a very good boy run off and he would stay for weeks at a time and the old general wouldn't know where he was. The old general speaks in his memoirs of his lonely evenings. He was the only one now in this great big old 40 room house. How he would sit out on summer evenings on the piazza until it was dark. That he was eager for any form of life, whatever. So much so that he would go into his library, open the windows so that the bats might fly in off of the wall. It was about that time that people began to hear that the old lion was going to marry the 15-year-old sister of uh, one of his tobacco tenants. And of course, everybody was very much up in arms about that. And I have here the thing that the manuscript that has interested me a very great deal, <clears throat> not only because of its graphic description of a very unusual event, but because of its literary quality, because it was written by a young newspaper reporter who lay, later became Kentucky's greatest author, James Lane Allen. And I'll, at the risk of uh, being tedious, I'll read you the few pages of that. It's dated Whitehall, November the 14th. This is what appeared in the Lexington papers. Cassius Marcellus Clay, the warrior, the abolitionist, the diplomat. General Clay, aged 80, age 15, at Whitehall at 10 o'clock yesterday morning. This was incidentally taken on the old lion's wedding morning. What a reporter saw and heard on the old lion's wedding day. The second childhood of Cassius Marcellus Clay, if this be his present state, does not prevent him from being a conspicuous figure of American history. While in his younger days, he was a veritable gladiator in the exciting arena of abolition. While in his mature manhood, he served his country in the halls of St. Petersburg as the American representative to that mighty nation. He is far happier today than he was whose shackles he had helped to loosen 
or listening to the adulation of the courtiers in the American legation at Russia's capital. When I arrived at Whitehall yesterday morning about 9.30 o'clock, after a long, cold, buggy ride over the hills and through the valleys bordering on the Kentucky River, I was met at the front door, which is a beautifully carved wild cherry with knobs of solid coin silver by a handsome, dark-complexioned, spare-built young man of medium height. Boy, evidently come back for the occasion. <laughs> who politely inquired who I was, and upon being told that I was a newspaper reporter, and recognizing me from a previous visit some time ago, he conducted me down the wide hall to the library. As we entered the large, richly furnished room, with shelves along one entire side running to ceiling and filled with books, while portraits in heavy gold frames and rare tapestries hanging on each the other three sides. The old general was busily engaged in replenishing the wood which snapped and blazed cheerfully from the big fireplace. Laying down his poker, I was greeted by this white-bearded old man with as much cordiality as was ever extended a royal visitor. You have met my son, Lonnie, have you not? Said he, waving to the young man who stood beside me. Nodding my head, I thought it time to explain my intrusion, so I quickly stated to the general that the American people, through me, their reporter and representative, desired to attend this wedding, which I understood was to take place that morning. I waited with my heart in my mouth as the old man hesitated a moment, but I immediately relaxed when he smiled and said, Well, I will say to you what Blaine said to the committee that waited on him and asked him if he would receive the people who wished to see him. Blaine replied that if the people wanted to see him, he supposed he would have to see the people. <laughs> if the people, after all these years, have that much interest in me, then I will have to be accommodating. So saying, the old general, general walked over to a large walnut chest and brought old bourbon out. <laughs> While he mixed himself a light toddy, despite other excesses, Cassius Clay has always been a most tempered user of alcohol, your reporter took a heavy straight, thereby stopping in their tracks the chills and shivers running over him from his 23 miles high. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Clay said that his children, meaning his children by Mary Jane Warfield Clay, had placed every possible obstacle in the way of his marriage. He said, they persuaded my old friend, Judge J John Chennault, not to marry me. I then asked Squire Green B. Million, but he refused. Yesterday, I suspected my former friends and relatives might get an injunction restraining me from marrying Miss Richardson. They thought they had caught me like a rat in a trap. So he continued, I determined to thwart their designs. And after dark last night, I armed McClellan Richardson, a brother of Dora, and Barlow Clark, one of my farm hands, and sent them 18 miles in the, into the foothills to Squire Isaac Newton Douglas, who is a good Christian, a kind-hearted gentleman, and one who sympathizes with me in my troubles. <laughs> the squire got up out of bed and rode all night on horseback over the roughest dirt road and trail so that he might get here this morning. He has just finished washing up and scraping off the mud and is now having a bite of breakfast in the kitchen. When he is ready, the ceremony will then take place. In a few minutes, Squire Douglas, a tall, slightly stooped mountaineer in butternut hand-woven jeans, a man of a good deal of unconscious, simple dignity, came from the direction of the kitchen into the room. 
With him was Dr. Smith, a physician of Richmond, Kentucky, and a collateral relative of the general. And McClellan Richardson, brother of Dora, a sturdy man about 30 years of age, obviously of the tenant class. Upon their arrival, the old general disappeared through the dining room door and immediately returned, leading pridefully his bride-elect to the hand. Several months past 15 years of age, Dora Richardson, daughter of a deceased sawmill worker at nearby Valley View, tall for her age and decidedly mature in physical appearance, hardly looks the child she is. She wore no gloves, no orange blossoms, and carried no bride's roses in her hands. She has a pleasant, rather thorns are too prominent for real beauty, and she is altogether rustic in her appearance and manner. The scene was a touching one. Never before and probably never again to be equaled in American life. The strangely paired couple stood quietly expectant as the squire thumbed awkwardly through his battered prayer book. A huge stick of wood burned in two and the fire flared a little, lighting up the fine bindings of the books. The gilded picture frames, and especially the exquisite copper engravings of Grand Duke Alexis and his beautiful princess, warmly inscribed by each of them and presented to General Clay on their own wedding day, at which he was an honored guest. Upon the death of Alexander II, which occurred quite a while ago, the Grand Duke had become Alexander III, Emperor of the Russias and his princess, the, the Empress. Yesterday, across the thousands of miles of land and sea, according to the Cincinnati Enquirer, which I carried in my overcoat pocket, the dead body of General Clay's royal friend was passing through densely crowded streets of St. Petersburg to the Cathedral of Lavadia, where his funeral was to be held with great pomp and ceremony. An event which, as I have since learned from the Telegraph, vies with General Clay's marriage on the front pages of this morning's Metropolitan newspapers. <laughs> the ceremony began, and the man who had led thousands to victory in a crusade for human liberty, who had joyously faced death in innumerable, innumerable desperate personal hand-to-hand -hand encounters, who in his youth was a perfect Apollo in appearance, not a Napoleon in the cause of freedom, whose portrait then hung in the palace of a dead emperor, stood as meekly as a little child with an expression of unspeakable happiness upon his time-worn but still fresh and almost youthful features. By his side stood that simple country girl, as shy as a gazelle knowing as little of the great world in which her venerable husband had played so conspicuous a part as the most untutored daughter of nature. The ceremony was very brief, and when it was over, the general gave her a vigorous kiss, which she bashfully but willingly returned. In another moment, she had disappeared through the dining room door. Dr. Smith and I sat down before the fire, listening with rapt interest to the general's reminiscences of his days in Russia, which came floating back upon him when I showed him the newspaper account of the emperor's funeral. As I got up to go, I asked General Clay if I could take a picture of his young bride. His expressive face darkened up instantly, and he replied, no, she is not dressed for that. Her hair is not fixed in the fashionable mode. You see, she has no mother, nobody to fix her up like other girls are fixed. She never had uh, a picture taken, continues the general. And when she does, she is going to be fixed up with nice clothes and her hair properly dressed. He readily assented to my request for his own photograph and obligingly stood against the large magnolias while the picture was being taken. He is in excellent health erect and muscular as an Indian, and bids fair to live many years if he will only quit fighting. <laughs> <laughs> he walked with me to the door, 
talking in his agreeable and courtly way, my rather hefty hand was lost and helpless in the grasp of that enormous paw now so gentle, which has laid such violent hold upon so many luckless adversaries. <laughs> Goodbye, my young friend, he said. Tell all my friends and also my enemies, there was just a feeding grimness in his smile, that I love my little bride better than any woman I ever saw. She is a good, virtuous girl, and I believe she will make me a good and loyal wife. Some think the old general is crazy, but I do not think so. His mind is as clear as a bell. I do not even think he is in his second childhood. But if he is, I shall hereafter have no fear of growing old. <laughs> well, as uh, Judge Logan, uh, Lincoln's law partner, used to say, there was quite enough scuttle <coughs> in Richmond and Lexington about this thing. Great outrage had been committed. So much so that uh, Judge Chenault, the very judge that had been the general's friend, included the comitatu. I think it must have had its origin back in the old days of the English law where when the ordinary machinery for the uh, compelling the observance of law had broken down, the sheriff on direction of the county judge was directed to uh, employ or appoint a committee of the people to put down the disorder. Under the statutes, the County judge was the only one who had the right to direct the sheriff to organize it. And then under our statute, the sheriff, in order that it may be dispersed, was required to report to the county judge in writing and advise them, him as to how the expedition for which it had been created had uh, fared. So it was that about, it could not have been more than two or three hours after James Lane Allen had left house, that the sheriff and six of his committee, comitatus, heavily armed, rode down the lane to Whitehall. Hitching their horses and taking appropriate precautions, they advanced under cover up to the front of the house. <laughs> the old general had been uh, suitably warned, apparently, of their uh, approach because he stood waiting for them on the piazza. He had his, had one of his cannon, he'd given one away, he, the only one he had, he had out there. He was a little short on the proper sort of ammunition, but he had done his best. He loaded it with pieces of trace chain and horseshoe nails, and <laughs> his horseshoe. He had his Winchester rifle with him, and he had his bowie knife strapped across his chest, and he had Lincoln's pistol. <laughs> and then he spoke to these uh, former friends of his as they peeped out from behind the trees. He said that it had been a very great pride of his through all the years that White Hall should be a place of hospitality for all his friends. <laughs> and it had been a place of hospitality. And he regretted that there should ever be occasion when it was not. But that inasmuch as these uh, gentlemen here seemed armed to the teeth and very cautious about exposing themselves, he was bound to conclude that they were there upon a hostile mission. And he was bound further to conclude that that hostile mission had to do with his young bride. Now, he said, gentlemen, uh, uh, nobody ever accused not even my worst enemy has ever accused Cassius Clay of ever detaining a woman against her will. And, of course, if I may be uh, immodest, I can say this, that nobody ever could say that they ever took a woman against, uh, away from Cassius Clay, either. <laughs> <laughs> now, he said, uh, making a very quick little bow, he said, Mrs. Richards, Mrs. Uh, Clay is up at this window here. You are quite at liberty to talk to her. She wants to go with you. Get her to remain with me. Why, that is entirely all right. I'm very glad to have you. Uh, I'll place her in your charge and you can take her. 
But if she doesn't want to go, then I can only urge you gentlemen in the interest of uh, opposition to the shedding of blood to depart and stand not on the order of your going. <laughs> Well, nobody knows who fired first, but they got into a shooting match there. Uh, I think there are at least uh, 16 bullet holes still in that uh, piazza door and the columns and door frames. The old general fired his cannon and knocked the tree down that the sheriff was behind. <laughs> He uh, emptied his Winchester rifle and then charged down the steps with Lincoln's pistol in one hand and his uh, <coughs> boy knife in the other. As to how that was viewed, I will read the port, <laughs> which the high sheriff, evidently Sheriff uh, Simmons, not being a particularly educated man, felt though that the dignity of this occasion required him to refer to himself as the high sheriff rule in Kentucky, they talk about the sheriff. They don't say a high sheriff, but he is a high sheriff. I think this would indicate perhaps about how the thing came out. It's Richmond, Kentucky, Wednesday, November the 14th, 1894. Judge John C. Chenault, dear judge, I am reporting about the posse, like you said I had to. <laughs> <laughs> Judge, we went out to Whitehall, but we didn't do no good. <laughs> it was a mistake to go out there with only ten men. <laughs> Judge, the old general was awful mad. <laughs> He got to cussing and a shooting, and we had to shoot back. <laughs> the old general sure did object to being arrested. <laughs> Don't let nobody tell you he didn't, and we had to shoot. I thought we hit him two or three times, but don't guess we did. He didn't act like it. <laughs> <laughs> we come out right good, consider it. I'm having some misery from two splinters of wood in my side. <laughs> Dick Collier was hurt a little when his shirt tail and breeches were shot off <laughs> by a piece of horseshoe and nails that come out of that old cat. <laughs> Have you seen Jack? I never did find out who Jack was. <laughs> he wrenched his neck and shoulder when his horse throwed him as we were getting away. <laughs> My God, you would have supposed that, uh, that, that Clay was the one that was after him. I know, as a matter of fact, I think he was, really. <laughs> Judge, I think you will have to go to Frankfurt and see Brown. <laughs> that was John Young Brown, who was the governor. <laughs> If he could send Captain Longmire up here with two light fielders, <laughs> he could divide his men, send some with the cannon around to the front of the house, not too close, not too close, and the others around through the cornfield and up around the cabins and the spring house to the back porch. I think this might do it. <laughs> Respectfully, Josiah P. Simmons, I assure you. That's the county. Well, that uh, ended not only the committee comitatus, but it ended uh, all uh, visible uh, effort on the part of the outreach community to rescue this young girl. She and the old general uh, lived quietly there in this big old house for about two years and a half. And then uh, she evidently became tired of living there. They apparently had no particular disagreement of any sort, but she indicated that she wanted to go, to go home back to her mother who lived uh, then at Valley View. 
With considerable politeness and ceremony, he hitched up his horse and buggy and took her home. And then he was instrumental in bringing about the divorce action and paying all the cost. And then an exceedingly remarkable thing happened. The next thing we hear of Dora Richardson, she has married a young tough from the Kentucky River Cliffs by the name of Riley Brock. Uh, Riley was a counterfeiter and a moonshiner, amongst other uh, uh, accomplishments. <laughs> and uh, an all around a typical citizen of that particular <laughs> Dora then seems to have persuaded, and this is almost beyond belief, persuaded the old general to take her and Riley in with her as his housekeeper and Riley as a tenant on the farm, which he did do. About a year after that, Dora had a son, and she named him Cassius Marcella Slay. <laughs> uh, there are the, those, you know, there are suspicious people everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> there are those who have said that the general uh, got his machinery working a little late, <laughs> but uh, uh, better late than never. <laughs> uh, nobody will know about that. Uh, but he did love the little boy. In the meantime, uh, R Riley grew worse all the time, drinking, drowsing around. And one day he undertook to uh, beat Dora, tried to carry her off take her over to Richmond and this little baby was ill. The general got out his pistol and he, uh, he indicated that he'd just soon for him to leave. And he did. <laughs> but that night, he and two other men broke in the uh, house there, in the front library, living room, uh, library uh, window. And there uh, in the dark, the old general fought his last battle. He met these three toughs with the pistol and with the knife. And he had it out with them right there in the, uh, with only the uh, uh, fire of the library and his dying embers to throw any illumination of a thing at all. When the little colored boy who had run all the way to Richmond to get to uh, some sort of uh, uh, relief and assistance. When he came back with these people, they found the old general sitting by the fire, what was left of the fire, uh, with his uh, bathrobe uh, scorched and burning. He had killed one of these fellas with a pistol. And the next morning, down back to the spring house that he speaks about, they found another fella. Uh, the general having followed his own technique right down below the navel and he was <laughs> ready for the undertaker. The general was only slightly wounded, but uh, uh, he fell into a decline uh, soon after that. So that uh, about the middle of June of 1903, the iron constitution of the old line broke rapidly. <coughs> then 93. And along about the first week in July, he was bedfast with uh, his pearl and Louis knife under his pillow. He uh, lived more and more in the adventurous, romantic yester years. He fought Sam Brown again, Russell's cave. He whittled and talked about slavery with Lincoln under the tall trees in Mather's pasture. He strolled along on the beach of smoothly frozen Neva River. He skated the stately quadrille with beautiful Anna Jean Petrov, star of the 
Imperial Russian Ballet, mother of his Russian son. And then, <clears throat> near twilight, on the evening of the 22nd day of July, 1903, a devastating tornado suddenly struck the bluegrass. It unroofed every barn on the Whitehall Plantation. The courthouse cupola and every church spire in the nearby town of Richmond were demolished. Giant uh, limbs from forest trees hurtled through the air like whistles of straw over at Lexington, China, Cushions, that uh, seemed like earthquakes. The bolt of lightning struck the statue of Henry Clay standing on its tall pedestal in the Lexington Cemetery and hurled the head 140 feet to the ground. <coughs> and then in less than half an hour it was over. The stars came out. The wind sank to a fresh, gentle breeze, and the thunder and the lightning ceased. Big Jim uh, Bar uh, uh, Bolin, the old general's nurse and bodyguard, tiptoed into the room, the sick room, to blow out the light, the oil lamp, as he usually did before the old general went to sleep. Tonight is not necessary. The old general was already asleep, his last sleep. Lying on his back with the <coughs> favorite bull and I peeping out from under the big pillar, his pain racked features now untroubled and serene. The restless, violent, stormy spirit of the old line of Whitehall had gone fearlessly forth to meet its maker in the mightiest tempest that ever Central Kentucky had known.